this this conversation is going to lead to some of the actions that we want to see as a, a as our output and as our uh, our campaign output. So uh, my my name again is Olumide, and I will be standing in for Ibrahim before Ibrahim comes back in. So please try as much as possible to mute your mic when you join the call. Try as much as possible to also, you know, put your video off when you are not speaking so that we can have a great uh, conversation and good sound from everybody. So uh, today we want to discuss about, and we also have guests. Our guest is from different organizations, but make sure that we make the gender very, you know, uh, we are gender sensitive in this conversation so we can hear from the two sides of gender what Nigeria should be looking at leading the 2023 election on the issue of climate action. And I'm sure that all of us will have been able to see a lot of conversation across social media on what this uh, candidates. And I just want to make a disclaimer that this is not a platform to campaign for any uh, candidates vying for presidential position, but a platform to see how we can influence the uh, manifesto to reflect climate uh, related actions that we want to see moving forward because a lot have been promised, a lot have been showcased for Nigerian government ahead of COP. And our present president have also made a lot of commitment ahead of COP26 uh, in COP26. And we are now moving to COP27 and a lot of commitment will be made. But in, 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 this, in the sake of a country, Nigeria, that we are looking at our election coming up in 2023, what should be our position? What should be the climate action we want to see reflected in this uh, document we are looking at. And that is why Vote for Climate Action Nigeria is aimed to campaign, is focused on position of candidates with respect to you know, critical environmental protection and climate change issues. And this is an, you know, we know that is an essential threat with a very you know, delicate timeline for us ahead of, ahead of uh, 2023 election. And by any Russian measure, the climate crisis should be a top tier issues for candidates and voters like you and like me, so that we'll be able to continue to fight for climate justice and demand for environmental justice ahead of uh, uh, this. And we know that this election is coming up in the first quarter of 2023, and Nigeria, we have the election for its, we're gonna have our next election uh, president governors, lawmakers, you know, every citizen, as we know, also own the, you know, right to vote as long as you are above 18. And we, I am also using this platform to ask us that, let's vote for climate action and let us represent our entity, our community, and what we are fighting for. You know, we have the duty rights to become familiar with different proposed representative, educate, educate ourselves about what are the plans, what are the missions, what are the visions and the goals in order for us to actually understand how we intend to ensure sustainable economic growth and development across value chain. So 2023 election is key for us, climate uh, uh, crusader, climate activists, and people that are working on related issues of sustainable development goals. So it let us begin now and continue until we have ourselves being, you know, part of this. So unfortunately, we've seen that not really all candidates have been able to spotlight the challenges that we are looking at and the opportunities in climate action, uh, which is uh, uh, that this climate crisis uh, present in all their campaigns, all their public engagement. And we know that climate change is being ignored in most candidates' uh, you know, speeches. We want to see concrete actions that, that matters, that addresses the issue or section of most candidates' agenda, which I uh, say. So uh, it's for me not to talk too much. I just want to open this floor for our speaker, and I'll be calling them for them to speak on this. But let us put it at the back of our mind. This platform is not to campaign for anybody. This platform is for us to seek and see what our, uh, our people are actually doing to make their campaign more successful in the network. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope to have all of you 
in this conversation ahead of time. So let me quickly give the floor for introduction to our mother, uh, our great mommy that have been doing fantastically well in the industry and have been mentoring most of us in the environment space. I want to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Priscilla Achatma for our introduction and presentation for the next 10 minutes so that we can get some key actions that we need to be looking forward to when we are going to the polling booth to vote for our candidate. Thank you, you have the floor, ma'am. Um, good morning, Olumedi. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be with you and seeing young people taking up most of these huge challenges. Most of the time, I feel so happy that when some of us have retired, uh, we know that there will, there's going to be continuity. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay. And uh, so um, you have already introduced me, um, Priscilla Achakba, um, the global lead and founder of Women Environmental Program, uh, which is a, a regional organization, but which we work across the world. But also our target group is young people. And we have like four thematic areas. We have the governance, we have the environment, we have climate change, and we have peace and conflict transformation. So what we're doing here today, the topic of today, also has to do with the issues of governance, but also the issues of climate change, and the issues of environment, and the issues of peace and security. So the topic we have today is a cross-cutting issue. Now, having said that, uh, we are going into elections 2023. What exactly JoJo's bizarre adventure? I mean, what's really bizarre is the fact you get no bitches. I mean, I hear you love anime, girl. That's that's a that's an issue from someone. Sorry, my about that. <laughs> they want to. <laughs> okay. Yes. I was just wondering. So, so we we need to as as climate activists as mothers, as young people who have reached the age of voting to do the need for. Just as you said, we are not here to campaign for anybody and we shouldn't be campaigning for anybody. But we need to know that the country today belongs to us. The country tomorrow belongs to each and every one of us. And the country will belong to those that are yet unborn. What part are we clearing for them? What do we know by climate change? And what do we know by the environmental issues? And what has environmental issues got to do with climate change? Or has to do, I mean, got to do with politics? And of course, the candidates themselves. These are questions that we should be asking ourselves. In the past, one of the things that our organization did was to train most of the politicians, people, those that were aspiring to become leaders, political leaders in this country, to train them to understand the importance of environmental in their agenda. Do we still do that? Olumide, if you ask me and you, at the center and of most of you, young people and some of us, Climate change, we do understand. But the very politicians that we are targeting, we should be the grassroots. Do they, all, do they really understand what climate change is all about? Can, you, can they link climate change with politics or with the positions that they're clever for? What are the agenda for their constituency? We have seen what is going on in the country today. Most of our communities are experiencing flooding and hundreds of people, thousands of people are displaced where hundreds of people have died as a result of the flooding in the country today. For the first time, we have Borno State, which is a desert prone area, flooded. Do we understand the implications of this? 
do our leaders actually know what this means and what can they really do? Now, the first thing I will say is that we as civil society organizations, we need to do a lot more. And what do we need to do? Climate change is like an abstract subject, which a lot of people don't understand. When we start speaking the jargon, decarbonization, what do they know, bring, bring, bring gas house emissions, what do they know by this? Can we unpack this language for the very leaders that are going to come into power to understand? And can we link these issues to their campaign strategies and to their campaign positions? Do they have anything in their campaign positions? Do they have anything that has to do with the environment? There are so many of them that erosion from the Southeast, we have Goli erosion from the South South, we have sea level rise, from the northern part of Nigeria, we have desertification. And in the middle belt, we have what we call farmer versus herders crisis. How do they address these issues? And what can they really do? How can they make this as a top priority for them when they come into government? And how can we help them to shape their own positions and their own agenda for the election. These are critical questions that we need to answer for ourselves and the people that are out there. Because if we don't address these issues, we are talking about the youth as the leaders of to tomorrow. I see the leaders, the youth as the leaders of today. And you need to begin to take up those challenges. How do we address those issues? These are critical questions that we need to answer. Awareness about climate change in relation to governance, in relation to politics, in relation to the sustenance of life. We are talking about the issues of mobility. How is climate change linked to the issues of mobility? A lot of us, a lot of people have been displaced and are moving from one place to the other. Although others see this as also an adaptation strategy, but beyond they seeing this as an adaptation strategy, what can we do? I speak from the part of the women. A lot of women, especially at the grassroots level, we have conflicts. Climate-induced conflict has affected this community. They are always at the receiving end. Even if they have to move, what happened to their petty businesses? Where they go to settle? Do they have the capital to begin in that place? And are they welcome? Do they have the same uh, community that they interact freely where they are going to settle? Can we look at climate change as part of the electionary campaign for our candidates? And how do we do that? I think we should call our leaders. First and foremost, the people that are coming for a campaign for presidency, we should have a conversation with them. What are the strategies? What are the plans of how they can address the issues of climate change. We know we have policies. The Climate Change Act, which Mr. President signed into law, and which they're now reviewing to address those issues. But it's not just about having these laws. How can we make them practical implementation on the ground? We have so many laws. Now is the time for us to act. And how do we do that? as civil society organizations, as new leaders, as women, we need to begin to engage with our leaders. When you talk, they will say government. Who is government? All of us are government. Can we find strategies of how we can engage with the government on the implementations of all this? 
how do we look at the issues of gender mainstreaming? And I speak from the fact that this election, majority of, let me say, how many youths have been able to win maybe their primaries? How many women have been able to win primaries? It's all about money politics. Is that what we want in this country? Apart from money politics, we have issues of poverty, the issues of violence. This is further not giving the opportunities of people who are credible to be able to come to contest, including youth and women. People with disabilities, how do we address those issues? For me, now is the time to act. Your vote is very important. Your vote counts a lot. That one vote that you cast is going to go a long way. We need to mobilize people from everywhere for them to come out in mass and vote. But while we're voting, we must vote wisely. We must look at the people that have this country at heart. And we're talking about the, the issues of climate change today. Those issues, will they take them on board? And how will they address it? I think I've spoken too much, I'll stop at this level. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Ma. Thank you for that uh, quick submission. Uh, for, for me, I think uh, you've actually made very great points in uh, uh, taking us in, into this uh, great conversation today. Thank you so much, Ma. And I'm very sure that uh, he will still be with us because we have some follow-up questions for you on that. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, let me quickly use this opportunity to say thanks to everybody that just joined us. Uh, let us try as much as possible to mute our mic when we get in. Um, I noticed that some people are trying to join and you know disrupt the conversation, but I will not allow them from the back end. Yeah, I will want to call uh, Ibrahim to take over now. I think he has a good internet now. Ibrahim, you have the floor. Thank you. I don't know whether Ibrahim is here. Uh, if Ibrahim is not yet available. Yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm here. Thank the you. Network is a bit epileptic, but um, it's better now. And um, thank you for taking charge of while I was battling with the network. And um, thank you, Madam Cecilia, for the wonderful contribution. Uh, it really went a long way, and um, we are able to tap a lot from your wealth of experience in the climate change space. Thank you very much, Ma. And um, I think um, before we move with the follow-up questions, and um, I don't know, uh, is it only Madam Priscilla that talks so that um, yes. I go around to other panelists and then- Yes, I, I think we should, move. we should move to other panelists to speak as well, then we'll come back to the follow-up question just in 30 minutes, then we'll clap. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I will call on um, um, Richard Abubakar Umar. Richard, are you there? Hello, Richard, are you there? Like it just popped out. Uh, I don't know, the network today is um, a bit terrible. Uh, thank God Aisha is here. Aisha, could you go next? Okay. Yes, good morning, everyone. Please, can you put up your uh, camera, please? Please, can you put, oh, yeah, please put up your camera? Please, I'm actually in the program. Okay. Yeah, this is better now. All right. Yes, good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's nice to be here today and then um, I must uh, commend uh, Madam Priscilla for all that she has said. Honestly, she has addressed a lot of the issues that needs to be addressed when it comes to um, voting rights for climate action in the next election. So I, I, I have this to say that um, there's really a lot of gap when it comes to um, mainstreaming climate action into manifestos or programs of uh, political candidates. And then 
one thing that comes to mind is um, this candidate are really are they really aware of climate change like madam Priscilla said and then the, the, we, we need to start looking at how to build the capacity of these people we have to start from the local level from the local government authority we need to begin to engage every candidate for instance in lagos i know um in the last uh, in the past election we have organizations that are working on climate change and environment they have been engaging the leaders but not as at the time of contesting the election they get to engage them when they get to offices so but this will be engaging them from the beginning of their campaign or even getting into uh, election period will be necessary for them to design programs and action plans that will help solve uh, and address climate action in in the country and in the state and otherwise in the country as well so we need to we need to start um, sit, we need to form an organization or coordinate ourselves as an, a civil society organization and begin to seek to to develop programs and campaigns that can help them that can even guide them because if they have an understanding of what they want to address they will be able to in, uh, input it into their own program agenda but if they do not have this capacity to do that, nothing will be done. So we need to start simplifying. We have a lot of um, policies and laws that Nigeria has signed on to in the international bodies. We need to simplify this and contextualize it so these people can understand. And even the people that will vote for them, they need to begin to see that if a, a political candidate comes to you asking for your vote, these are the kind of questions you ask them. These are the things you look out for in their manifesto for you to choose or to decide your, to make a decision on who to vote for. If this is not there, then you are not going to hand my vote, especially the women at the local grassroots. So we need to simplify, contextualize the policies, the laws and the frameworks that we have that is guiding us on in, in, in addressing climate change. Even the indices and begin to, to engage this with the, the candidate and the people so they understand, they know what questions to ask, even the candidate can even know what to campaign for. And then another thing is participation is key. For us that we know, we know a lot of these issues, we need to begin to participate in even in politics. From the grassroots, if you're not going to, to engage, we need to be part of the poly, poly, uh, poly, uh, governance by, by contesting elections and even uh, lobbying for positions in uh, in in government so we can start uh, help, uh, supporting the government in creating programs that will address climate action at the local lobby local level and then contributing to uh, uh, environmental sustainability in the country so these are just the uh, what i need to add to what madam priscilla said thank you for having me everyone thank you very much for the wonderful submission and um if I get you clearly, one of the important points you mentioned uh, is ensuring we build the capacity of these um, political leaders in order for them to understand um, the, the need for urgent action on addressing the climate crisis. Thank you very much. And um, I'll move to Mr. Richard Abubakar Umar. Please, in just one minute, do you have anything to wrap up before I follow up with uh, the questions? Thank you very much. Um, I feel a vote for climate is quite important at this time. And I want to really commend the effort of Madam Priscilla Chakwa because she has been doing well in trying to carry the grassroots along. Because I remember last year, she involved four ministries from Niger State, which I facilitated their participation at a gender mainstreaming workshop, which really got back to their various ministries and the report got to the commissioners. Though the major problem we're having is engaging, I mean, expanding the awareness creation to the grassroots because we as frontline community-based organizations have been trying our best to make the people understand what climate change is. Like just yesterday, I was just sitting down and we saw a group of birds just coming together and when I was asking, the local people there were telling me that this is a sign that rainy season is going and dry season, dry season is coming. And I'll say, how do they know that? That normally, if you see these um, birds floating around at the end of the evening, it is ushering in, it's telling you that dry season is about to come. 
these are local knowledge about climate change that even we that went to school don't even know, but the local people know. But how do we expand these conversations and engage them to really understand that climate change is a serious issue. Climate change has a lot to do with governance. How do you balance the conversation between governance and, and, and the effects of climate change? And how do they now make it a duty of raising conversations during campaigns, during consultations from politicians coming to them to seek for their votes during elections? These are very critical issues because we are looking at people being displaced, especially like, for example, now there's a community called Kato Community in Niger State, a Mokwa local government. It has totally been submerged. When I mean submerged, no school, no houses, no welfare. The, 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 the villagers have been relocated to a new settlement. How do they understand that this, this uh, circumstance is not as a result of a, a, a mystic, um, thought that maybe the gods are angry with them or they've done something wrong, but understanding that the, the government has a role to play in terms of uh, understanding what climate change is. The question is, how many of our local government chairmen understand what climate change is? How many of our member state assembly understand what climate change is? To me, climate change is more of a local problem, excuse me, than a national problem. So we've been discussing NDCs, we've been discussing how to achieve them, but you have to come back locally to build these carbon sinks, to involve community, to watch over this forest. Because right from time, they have their own mechanism and their own ways of managing their climate crisis. But have we really, really come down? Have we really, really mainstream these local communities into policies, into activities of climate change? We are trying our best to see that we get more participation from the subnational government to local governments to see that more of our local people are given opportunities to platforms like this, to attend national activities, to understand the conversation, to even be at COP. Like, it will it, 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 it be interesting to know that in Madrid, when we were at COP 25, we saw primary school children, secondary school children making, I mean, secondary school children in their uniforms, making presentations about climate change, making you understand that they mainstream them even to their secondary school level. So imagine a child like that or a student like that in a privilege to be in a, in a garden of a political um, sitting. Definitely, she will raise issues concerning the environment and to see that that policymaker makes commitment of what he's going to do. I feel this conversation is coming at the very right time. I feel maybe Olumide had overheard me at the Pakja Pan-African uh, last meeting for CRPs and YDs, where I raised a very sensitive issue. I was talking about how we can engage young parliamentarians, parliamentarians that are young in the state house of assemblies, in the national house of assembly, let us make them champions of climate change. We just have the National Climate Change Council um, inaugurated and we have been doing well at the national level. How do we trickle this down to the local level and see that everybody down to our councillors, that we understand what climate change is, we understand what climate action is and we understand the role of the people and the role of government in ensuring that they capture this, even in their local budget. Thank God we now have citizens budgets in place. We need to carry these conversations. We need to have more town hall meetings. We need to engage these people. We need to domesticate what climate action is in local languages. Like here in Niger State, I was um, able to work with the state, Niger State, uh, I, was pro I provided technical support for the state uh, sustainable development goals, where we were able to localize the SDG goals into three major languages in Niger State, which is Baki, uh, Nupe, and Kambari languages, including Hausa and English. So we localized this and they were able to push, we were able to push advocacy to traditional rulers, to communities, gave them these books to understand what climate action is. We need to have more of these conversations at the local level so that these people will know how to engage with policymakers, with politicians, and raise sensitive issues to attract project, projects that will address their climate crisis and challenges. Thank you very much, as I Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Richard, for the wonderful uh, submission. And um, you made it clear, if I got you right to that, um, there is need also to bridge the communication and knowledge gap between the policy makers and the grassroots on issues around climate change. And um, there is need to amplify uh, indigenous knowledge of the environment. And um, having mentioned uh, 
the issues of flooding. I think um, I have a follow-up question, but I will start with uh, Madam Priscilla. Um, I have been wondering uh, about uh, the current flooding issues in Nigeria, and um, there is no argument that um, climate change is the major driver of all the flooding cases uh, we experience in Nigeria. Um, uh, what do you think can be done to ensure that um, our political leaders or elected officials prioritize um, mitigation and adaptation uh, ahead, as a, ahead of 2023 elections, especially that um, flooding uh, proved to be an uh, urgent national concern cutting across all regions in the country, just like uh, um, Richard mentioned, the community is submerged. I know that the community had AGI in uh, the Gawa state. UB has experienced that. Kuji is still battling with the impact. Bayelsa rivers and delta states all are significantly uh, affected by flooding. What ways do you think we can adopt in order to ensure that these elected officials prioritize uh, these issues and consider them uh, issues of national concern. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, thank you, um, uh, facilitator. Uh, first and foremost, let me say that uh, the flooding has, that, has, that has occurred this year um, has kind of uh, preceded what happened in 2012. 2012 was bad, but this year, I can say it's worse. Now, this is where we need political leadership. This is where we need territorials uh, or bilateral discussions and agreements with other countries. I can say that uh, from the axis of the North East, where we have Cameroon, the dam, the Lado Dam. And then from the Niger side of it, where we have Burkina Faso, who also have released their water. They have a huge dam. This is an area where we need our political leadership to have discussions with these countries to address these issues. For instance, from the northern part of Nigeria up to the east, where they are heavily, and the south-south, where they are heavily impacted by the flood. You know that the Lado Dam from Cameroon, which was released, is the major cause for some of these flooding. And then you have Burkina Faso, which also has a large dam, which the dams were all overflowing, and they decided that the best option is to release the water from these dams. But I also strongly believe that if our political leaders have foresight, a discussion with these countries would have ensued on how, even if they are going to release the water from the dams, they would have been able to release in such a way that the people will not be heavily impacted. Now, having said that, when you look at the issues of adaptation strategy, especially when it, when it has to do with the issues of flooding, we have over 500 dams in the country. Are these dams functional? What can our political leaders do to address and to make these dams functional? So that even if Cameroon decides to release water or Burkina Faso from the other end decides to release water from their dams, these dams that we have in the country will be able to absorb them. That is one of the areas that I felt that Nigeria would have done very well. We have Kashimbila Dam, which is in Benue State. If that dam is completed and is functional, the situation that we are experiencing 
from the situation that we're experiencing, especially from the north central going to the southeast and to the south south, would have been addressed. At least the Kashim Black Dam would have been able to contain some of this, thereby, I mean, addressing the issues of the when you talk about adaptation. The other areas, just as uh, Abubakar said, we have, Richard said, there are tremendous indigenous knowledge that the communities have. But most of the times we prefer to go and reinvent the way and go and bring technology from outside that is not adaptable, it's not suitable, and it's not environment friendly to our communities. Can we get our tech, I mean, our, our communities, can we enhance the indigenous technology, the indigenous people, and use their technology and enhance them on how to address those issues? Until we start looking inward, we know that no, no nation can stand on its own, but we need to enhance our technology. In the past, India and China, they were coming to Nigeria or coming to, I mean, African countries to come and learn. The best uh, uh, technologies, the, the best experts we have in the world are Nigerians. And they are doing wonderful things in other parts of the world. Are we, do we have the foresight of bringing them and creating that enabling environment for them? When I mean enabling environment for them to be able to come and bring that expertise and skills that they have to come and help this country address all those challenges. How do we engage the youth when it comes to those innovations in adaptive situations such as this? How do we involve the women groups, the people with disabilities? I feel sad, especially for people with disabilities and the aged, because in most of the crises, like climate-induced crises, they are the ones that are actually are mostly affected. And yet, when we have plans and policies, they are not actually involved, or even when they are involved, they are involved in just passing. Is there a situation whereby we can look at our policies, look at our programs, and begin to plan? In the cities, we have town planners. How have they felt? You find out that most of our cities are planned in such waterways, And so when there's heavy rainfall, most of those waterways that have already been blocked are now submerged. How do we deal with those issues? We need the town planners, urban planners. We need all of them to be together, to be able to address those issues. And of course, I know that in the rural areas, it's not just happening only in the cities, but also in the rural areas. But the communities have their own adaptive strategies. Can we support them with the technology and enhance their own technology to be able to use it to address those issues? For me, these are critical things. Policy must translate into actions and actions must translate into on the ground, not just actions in the air but on the ground where people will feel it. And that is one of the things that we need to call our political leaders actions to it. We need everybody's involvement. The government cannot do it all by itself. We as civil society organizations, what roles are we going to play when we are talking about adaptations? The young people are very innovative, I've seen so many innovations from the young people in addressing these issues. Can we support them technically and financially to be able 
to build up to, I mean, to scale up these innovations that they have. I have seen so many of them. Now, when you talk about the issues of blockage of waterways, today, Nigeria, I'm so happy that Nigeria has signed up, up to the National Plastic Action Partnership. This plastic action partnership is what is what is killing us. And you go to our environment, you see the way that plastic is everywhere. Other countries have even banned single, uh, have banned plastic and have even banned single plastic users. Is there a way that Nigeria can take up some of those issues and work with them? Who are Nigerians? We are Nigerians and we are leaders of today and we should be able to forge that. Thank you. Over Muhammad. Mama, you are muted. Thank you so much, Ma, for the um, wonderful submission. And um, I can't agree more because um, there is need to build the capacity of uh, young people as well as the old to balance uh, the status quo, and um, which calls for, of course, intergenerational equity in addressing uh, the climate change impact. And I'm um, mentioning an uh, issue of uh, uh, adopting and uh, ensuring that uh, we scale up indigenous knowledge and um, build the capacity of young people in respect to addressing the climate change uh, crisis and um, doing our best, ensuring that everyone is involved and all hands are on deck. Um, I have a question for Aisha Titilola and um, how do you think we can balance the status quo, uh, ensuring that people, the grassroots and um, the leaders are all brought up to speed and um, ensure that all has of our own deck? Thank you. Hello, Aisha, are you there? I think maybe she's having a, a network issue. Richard, can you respond to the question? Hello, Richard, can you hear me? Hello, Lumide, can you hear me? It's like you can't hear me. Yes, we can hear you. I think it's just... Um move to Richard by asking him his own question. I think uh, uh, Titi is having issue with her internet. All right, no problem. Hello, Richard, are you there? It's like Richard is also having the same uh, issue. Okay. Um, I think um, before the, the, the we are back, um, let me date, can you give uh, us your own uh, parting thoughts about um, how best we can ensure that uh, they are brought up to speed in ensuring the prioritized mitigation and adaptation issues to climate change and um, prioritize it as a national issue. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, um, Mohamed. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Like I said, I think uh, almost all our speakers have actually raised very important points uh, moving ahead to this conversation. And I cannot but only say that uh, what we are just demanding for is that the livelihood of people need to be prioritized. And they also, we need to also understand the awareness of climate change and the need for climate change and the demand for climate justice needs to you know, grow day by day. And they need to also understand why this is an important aspect for the people. You know, we are so expected that uh, uh, the, the potential we have as a country with our natural resources need to drive an investment from our government to see that climate justice and climate action is very, very key for us. These are very important aspects that we need to be looking at. Uh, Dr. Priscilla keep mentioning the issue of innovation of young people. 
I think uh, it's it's very important for government to or the candidates to start looking at how they can build or use young people to build investments or build innovation for job opportunity. And it's very, very critical that we need to start looking at that aspect because if young people are the leaders of today, how are you building their capacity in getting green jobs, in tapping into investment opportunities, in making sure that uh, climate action is taking the front line because everything surrounding the sustainable development goals uh, talks about the environment and they should we, we should look at how we can choose them uh, people that are involved in uh, in issues that relate to actions that comes out from all this conversation that we are we've uh, talked about today and most importantly getting to the polling book what is that key messages that we are looking at when we say vote for climate action. It cut across every uh, chain. Uh, somebody have mentioned our national determined contribution. How are they prioritizing adaptation? How are they prioritizing mitigation? You've also asked about loss and damage, the issue of flooding. How are we making it a priority for our candidate to make sure that the responsibility of putting the country in a climate related or friendly space start from this election if we are voting. So it's very important for us to start looking at what is our priority for all this cluster. Under the NDC alone, we have in transportation, we have waste management, we have energy transition plan, we have sort of, we have agriculture. So it is very key for us to start looking at the broad understanding of what is going to be their agenda. And everything we've mentioned here today, is a priority for us as we're going to the polling boat. Uh, and another thing again is, as young people, what do we want to see in combating the impact or the, the adapting to climate change, as well as how would we make sure that Nigeria experience climate justice in all aspects of our action? So this is my own submission, and I think as we continue to make uh, our final submission in this call, we'll be able to bring out so key messages that we're going to be sharing with this. Uh, uh, so candidates that will be talking to us on the agenda for climate action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful submission. And um, it's indeed critical that uh, all these policies, plans, and action plans are being really implemented. and. Uh, in more equitable and inclusive way. And um, before we proceed, I'm sure there are a lot of questions and contributions. I can see Sheifumi Adebote, Musa Ibrahim raising their hand. Shay, can you mute yourself and sub make your submission? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Am I audible? Am yes, I audible? You are. Great. Yeah, uh, my yeah. question is a bit critical, but I would love to get some perspectives on it. And uh, my point is this, if we're making conversation around or we're stressing the importance of um, voting for climate action and we want to hear the opinion of people when it comes to climate issues, how then do we balance this in a case where a political figure or a party or a person uh, has not been able to communicate clearly his plans for taking climate action. However, is he able to communicate clearly economic um, projections or security projections or other areas, but has no opinion or has no thoughts or no sense of direction when it comes to climate action? Does this put us in a limbo? Do we then say, oh, we'll rather vote for someone who speaks about climate action, but other areas are at risk or you know, other areas are not so clear, or we decide and say, okay, we'll just vote for someone else who has clear sense of direction on other issues, even if it doesn't have anything specific on climate change. I don't know if that question is clear and if anyone has thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I got you. I don't know if uh, the speakers were able to capture the question correctly. And um, the question is um, most of the uh, political aspirants or the uh, yeah, potential uh, candidates uh, didn't actually clearly 
specify their plans for um, climate change, but uh, some of them have made clear submissions on other issues. Now, what decisions should we take in respect to, to, to our decision on elections? Do we go for people with clear um, um, plans, even though they didn't prioritize climate change, or we go with people that specifically prioritize our climate change issue? Um, Olumide, are you responding or Madam Priscilla? I, I can respond to that. Um, she, she, thank you very much for that question. And uh, I make haste to say that um, most of the people, most of the candidates, as you can see from the campaign already, are only concerned about the issues of security, the issues of economic well-being, of the country, but most of them have not linked, for instance, the issues of security, which is climate induced in most cases, most of them have not linked that to the issues of insecurity that they're talking about. Now, when you talk about also the issues of economic sustainability or economic um, uh, situation for the country, it also, climate change also is linked to the issues of economy. And of course, uh, with the climate change, with the, with the devastating effect that it has now, a lot of people are already impacted, economically and otherwise. So yes, a lot of candidates, majority of them, are not even linking the issues of climate change to their campaign strategies. Now, it behoves on us. We cannot throw them away. Like I stated before, most of them, climate change, most of them don't even understand what climate change is all about. Most of the times when we speak about climate change, climate change is like an abstract subject that even the elites, some of them don't even understand. My my years of experience working in the area of climate change has shown that even the people that we appoint or the people that we elect have little or no knowledge or background about what climate change is all about. But that does not mean that we cannot engage them. We need to engage them. We need to build their capacity in this area. We need to help them articulate what climate change issues are, are all about so that they can even put it in their campaign manifestos and use it. And until we do that, most of them will continue to neglect the issues of climate change. So this is an issue for all of us. It's not just for issues for Olumidi, issue for Priscilla, but issue for the civil society. So how do we do that? We need to build networks, especially in relation to climate change and the 2023 elections. How do we begin to engage? We already have the people that have won their primaries from the community level to the national level. How do we engage them? Remember I spoke that up before, that we can bring some of these presidential candidates together. In one room, I know it's difficult to get them, but if they really like this country, and these are tropical issues that are being discussed worldwide, climate change does not know whether you are rich, you are young, you are old, you are small, you are poor, you are not. Climate change does not know that. The only thing is that climate change impacts us differently. So we, but we need to engage them. We need to build their capacity. Nobody has monopoly of knowledge. We don't, I don't. And I learn every day, especially from young people, you who are very innovative such as yours, such as you people here. So how do we engage these people to begin for them to understand why it is important for them to bring in the issues of climate change in their manifestos? But not just this party, not just the people that are out there, the, the electorates as well. How can we get some of those, their party manifestos 
get into their party mandates and their constitutions. These are issues that we need to do. We can engage them one-on-one. -on -one. We know the political parties that are here in this country. So how do we engage them? For me, engaging every person and bringing up the issues of climate change for them to understand is key. And not just those that think only about uh, insecurity, economic, corruption, and the rest of them. Those are not the issues. We need to bring everybody to the table. For those that want to hear us, the most hear. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful submission, Ma. And um, I can't agree with you less because um, some of them might be interested uh, in ensuring that these issues are addressed, but uh, are uninformed only when we engage them and ensure that they understand the problem and um, how best the, the problem can be solved and we work together. So definitely engaging them is key. Um, Musa Ibrahim, can you go ahead with your question? All right, um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, before I continue, Shaifu, me touch a fragment of the question I wanted to ask. And um, fortunately, the Dr. Priscilla was able to highlight broadly on the question I intend to ask. But um, um, so, um, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, fantastic. Um, I want to take us back, although we are coming to the end of this program. At Benicio, for decades now, we have been facing severe climate induced disasters in Nigeria. And if I take us, if I take our knowledge down to other countries of the world, for instance, in US, Joe Biden was able to amass large votes from the election because he has huge plan for climate action. The president, the current president of Australia was able to um, amass a large amount of vote because he, ha he brought is to bring about a policy that will help in their climate action, adaptation, mitigation strategies. But in Nigeria for many decades now, despite we are facing the brunt of climate change, I've been issued, there have not been any candidate that has really brought about serious, um, um, uh, serious plans to mitigate or adapt to the issue of climate. So what are some of those factors that has allowed or given the previous rulers or candidates we have the impetus not to be um, talking more about climate in induced disasters in their manifestos or in their plans to rule the country or govern the country. What are so I've been sure, what are some of those things that made them not to think more about climate change? Thank you. Thank you so much, Aliu, for the who will address the question. Madam Priscilla addressed most of the questions, so I think um, someone else should take over. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, my, uh, doctor actually addressed those key questions. I just want to also add to it that uh, in as much as we need to also look at different areas that is very important for the country. That's where when I'm making the submission, I said, look at the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals, actually capture some of the critical problems we are facing in the country. And there's no way you want to talk about food security. There's no way you want to talk about gender. There's no way you want to talk about uh, inno uh, innovation or you want to talk about partnership for peace that doesn't comprises of environmental issues. So I think what we just need to infuse into our statement or our action when we are putting out is to see that we are not neglecting any aspect of the developmental issues. But the climate action we are talking about is what are the sustainable actions? What are the relative actions that brings together the SDGs, that brings together people's likelihood that they need to capture in moving forward. And most of them are focusing more on security. We have people talking about climate security now. It's something that is very, very key conversation. So there's need for them to infuse the climate related conversation into every point they are raising. And this can only help us to 
actually achieve more by getting the point they are saying. So we are not leaving out any other aspect of conversation, but we are trying to say that what is your stand? How do you bring together all those issues to make sure that our development is secure for future? So uh, I think that's my own submission on that um, aspect. Thank you so much as we round up. Thank you so um, much. Uh, for just, the to add to what, just to add to what uh, Olumide has said, um, <laughs> you people want me to be putting on my video for second per second. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, when you make a comparison with Nigeria and other developed countries, Sometimes I know that all of us wants our country to be as much developed as the other countries and our leaders as much aware, more informed and taking responsibility like the developed countries. But what are our own small actions? citizens of Nigeria. We need to engage these people. Remember that when you say that other developed countries, their leaders plan and include strategies of dealing, for instance, disasters induced by climate change into their own actions, into their own manifestos into their own plans. Have we really taken time to engage with our leaders from the grassroots to the top on these issues as civil society organizations? And can we, going forward, there are a lot of things that ICC, DI, is articulating as we discuss this. After this webinar, is there a possibility that for some of you that have asked these questions, that we join so that we can plan? The little action that you do, that person, that woman, that youth that is contesting in your local government, in your world, can you engage them and say, look, I need to help you articulate your position as a candidate and bringing these actions going forward. We talk so much about what we want our government to do, but how much have we tried to engage them? It's a very difficult terrain, no, no doubt. So don't think that it's easy. It's not easy to engage even with people in your home. How much more are taking, talking about engaging the government? But we live with them every day. So should we just stop because it's difficult? So the question is back to you. How do we move forward? And moving forward means that all of us need to be involved. We need to help them design this program. Nigeria is our country. We don't have any other country. For me, I am not going to go to any other country to go and stay. I live here and I die here. This is my country. So what do we do? We need to take actions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so MS, MS, I don't know if I can add a little to yes, to what you can, you can, can add for the submission. Yes. Can, can, I I can, hear you? can I add a little to what Dr. Chap have said? Yes, you can. Okay, yeah, yeah please do. We are around engaging, you know. Yeah, engaging with government. I believe we have to take it upon ourselves to see that we see government as partners in progress, as people that need our guidance rather than criticism. Because yes. over the years, we've always stood at the point of criticizing, criticizing without moving forward. So now, as development partners, we have to not only raise the red flag, but as well provide the solutions to the to what causes, causes the raising of the red flags. 
So moving forward, like for example, in Niger State where we've been able, we've been able to start by committing the state gradually. Like personally, uh, my organization have engaged with the state SDGs, as I told you, we did localization of the SDG goals. We now moved into climate action. The state government trained 500 youths and women on briquettes making to address the issue of charcoal production. It took a lot of energy. It, it didn't just sound the way I'm sounding it, but it took a lot of energy to convince them to see reason why we should take this action because we are the largest producer of charcoal and firewood. So if you want to take out charcoal, they have put a lot of laws. We have green guards, we have a mobile court, but forest court, sorry. But if you're using force on this, how do you give an alternative? That alternative came from so that an alternative green decent jobs so that we can alternate the, the, the charcoal production. It wasn't easy. I went, went as far as lobbying to have four of the government, three of the government, four of them to go to COP in Madrid. And when they went to COP, it broadened their horizon. Today, as I speak to you, Niger State is the largest, has the largest investment on solar. Just last three weeks, they just made another huge investment to connect communities over 260 communities now of grid. So of grid, which has been, is called this a solar project. So the state government has really, really um, accepted because we were able to push them and technically engage with them to make sure that they take the right step in the right direction. So with this little submission I, I just raised, I just want to make you understand that we can all do this. If we can just push, even within our local government, if it's within our state government, we have the energy to drive. We just keep pushing until we start getting results. It really took a lot of energy and time, but thank God we are, we are heading the right direction and we're looking forward to other states um, learning from our model and seeing that we drive this forward. And again, I, I, I would like to announce that this year, because of all these milestones, the state government has raised an 11 month delegation to COP in order to participate in a lot of side events, in order to tell the world what they're doing to rural communities, to connect them off grid and what they are, what solutions they are providing in order to achieve the goals of the SDGs. So this is quite um, commendable on, to the state government for being this committed in terms of taking climate action and achieving the SDGs as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much um, for the wonderful submission. And um, I think um, on the chat, oh, Aisha, do you have a, please go ahead with yes, your- Yes, please, thank word. you, yes. Thank you. Sorry, I, I am, I'm actually in another program, so I'm moving in between two. Sorry about that, my attention was needed. I had to give me attention to something. Okay, this, um, for us to achieve a vote for climate action, see, we have said a lot of things here. Yes, and in fact, I have lost out on things I wanted to say because a lot of them has been addressed. But one thing I want us to look at too, I, I, in fact, I want to re-emphasize the fact that um, there is need to communicate, communicate climate change and to continually to um, build the capacity and understanding of people on climate change issues and even the political leaders. Recently, the flooding that has ravaged the country is an entry point for us as an organ as organization, civil society organizations addressing climate change to begin to create awareness, to make people see why they need to act on climate change. And one of the things I think one action plan that we need to take away from this webinar is to begin to engage instantly to engage political parties. We have vibrant young people in almost all these political parties. And I know they have um, youth uh, wing and all those ones. We can start to engage them and build the capacity of uh, the political, not only the political aspirants now, but we have to build the capacity of the party to understand. And I know it may be something we may not achieve in 2023, but we'll, we'll have achieved a milestone and then we, we continue on that uh, come, uh, uh, forward to the next election, right? But we need to start now. Within, from our local government, uh, Mr. Umar has said a lot of things how, about what Niger State government is doing, and even in Lagos, because this is where I am based, and I know that I can bring examples of what has been done from Lagos State, but we need to continue. We need to start building the capacity and understanding of the people and the government, of the political parties, in case somebody does not even win an election, but the person eventually gets an appointment 
in the in the in the administration going forward so they will know that these are critical issues and they vote for climate action is a vote for poverty free country uh, uh, human uh, livelihoods enhancement and all of these things so without climate action every other goals or every other every other vision that we have as a country may not be sustainable so we need to start now with the political parties the people at the grassroots community and we keep to we keep on engaging them even after the election and, and a monitoring and reporting of all these strategic action plan that we are going to include in the manifestos has to be monitored and ensure that it is implemented. So this is just my submission and the women has to be at the forefront of everything. Thank you. Thank you so much Aisha for the concluding um, remarks. I think um, without much ado, I will hand over the man to, to Fulumi Day for him to give us the closing remarks and um, we call it a day. It's supposed to end by 12 and um, because the conversation is very important and critical for us, we are moving towards 12.30 at the moment. So Fulumi Day. Yeah, thank you very much, um, my brother. Thank you so much, uh, Mohammed, for, you know, moderating this powerful conversation. Uh, I know we are just starting and I'm sure with all the key messages, key points we've gathered from this conversation, we'll be able to build a content that we use in engaging these people. One of the key takeaway that I think we need to start looking at that uh, I've gotten from our number one, we need to engage our you know, uh, 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 aspirants, the ones that have won their primaries majorly on the local level, because when we empower them from the local level, they will understand how we need to build on that success to the you know, higher level we are looking at. Then secondly, we've talked about how we can start communicating climate change, which is very, very key for people in the party that doesn't really understand the importance and impact of climate change in our environment. And lastly, somebody also mentioned that uh, we need to start looking at how we can engage the youth wing of these parties that are coming out to contest or to, so that they will be able to understand that this issue of climate change is a humanitarian issue and is an issue that is humanity issue as well as it is a, is a conversation that we need to continue to empower ourselves on, even though as we call ourselves environmentalists, there are a lot of actions and activities that we can still also talk about. So I think uh, moving forward, uh, like I said, in one of our conversation with, all the organization here that we're going to be also be coming up with what we call the press conference so that it also make the media to understand our point. So the outcome of this conversation is going to be some of the key points that we're going to put forward for our medias to also showcase and put there so that these leaders, these aspirants, these candidates can see that environment, climate change, development issue, is a priority for a country like uh, uh, like Nigeria that is looking ahead of the 2023 election, the first quarter of next year. So I want to use this opportunity to appreciate all the speakers, Dr. Priscilla, my brother from Niger, uh, 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 Madam Titi Lola, and everybody at the moderator today for giving your time to do this. And I'm sure that as we continue our efforts, we not just go, but I thought we continue to produce more opportunities for ourselves. So in future, we hope we have the platform to share concern with those candidates who are not actually responding or laying out a strategy to address the climate crisis. We will continue to look at political orders that need to you know, hear from us. And it's up to us to actually put them on on tools to see how they can respond to all these questions that we're going to be putting to them. And we're going to be developing a social media, you know, buzz on this to get them to recognize that climate change is an essential threat and action that is needed now. And we need to chart a clear course for some of, uh, for the same before the election starts. So thank you very much, doctor. Thank you very much, um, Aliu, everybody on this call, Thank you very much, uh, Aisha Titilola. Thanks to everybody that joined us across Nigeria. And we look forward to 
take this for just engage with the hashtag vote for climate action ng as we move on we are going to be also reaching out to everybody that attend this call on the uh, uh the press conference we are planning to see that uh these leaders or these candidates hear from us and they see and we're going to be sharing all these things on different media platform news online also so for people that couldn't enjoy today we're going to upload this platform on our website or on our youtube platform climate wednesday or climate word on youtube for you to listen and watch again to know how you can engage your leaders in your community level thank you very much and please i want to request that if it is possible for us everybody to put on their video so that we can take a picture before we leave just a picture before all of us leave if you can put on your video i'll be very happy. Be i'll be looking so rough i don't want to snap again you've had enough of me Mommy, don't worry. You you look you look good to us. Don't worry. Anybody, you look you look you look good. Yes. Yeah, so if you are joining us, you can put your video on. Let me just take this picture. Then we we off uh, we call off the call. So if you are if you are there, so let us see you. Let's see your video. I'm still waiting for some people to put on their video. Just. In two seconds, I will take the picture. One, two, three, go. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Have a lovely week ahead. And stay connected on social media with the hashtag Vote for Climate Action Nigeria. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.